Welcome to Chem Lectures Ammonia. We'll be running through the notes today itself. There's no, there, there are no lesson slides for this one because this is a pretty straightforward topic where most of the content involves direct recall and simple mole concept calculations. So before we begin, right? Where, where do you think you will first actually encounter ammonia in your life? It's probably not in the laboratories. It will be probably it will pro probably be in the window cleaners. If you were to go home and find the window cleaning solution and open the bottle and smell, right? The a large part of the smell actually comes from ammonia. Ammonia is mixed into the window cleaner to allow it to clean your your glass panels, your glass surfaces into into a real real really nice shine. And the next most in, actually the most important use of use of ammonia in fact is actually to use to make fertilizers and as you know we all need to eat the plants need to grow how do you ensure that there's enough plants growing to produce food for everyone in the world you must top it up top up their, their growth their growth food with fertilizers and fertilizers a large part of it contains ammonia why because ammonia formula is NH3 N is nitrogen and nitrogen is required for plant growth N is actually required for protein synthesis in the plants. Right, so let's move through the notes of ammonia. This will be a pretty fast lesson because there's not much content actually. Right, before we begin to introduce the reaction in which by which ammonia is made, first of all we need to understand one concept called reversible reactions. All along we have always been doing reactions which involve arrows going in one direction. This is called a this is called an irreversible reaction. It means product A and product B will become C and D, and this is one way. There's no way C and D can become A and B again. So this is a this is an irreversible reaction. But for a reversible reactions such as the one in which ammonia is synthesized with N2 plus H2 gives you NH3. There's both a forward reaction, which is from the, the reactants to the products. And there is also a backward reaction, which is from the products to the reactants. So both reactions are actually progressing at the same time. So how much product we actually get depends on how fast is the forward reaction. So if my forward reaction produces more product, then the product can break down into the reactants. It means that the yield of the reaction is really high. Okay. So importantly, both take place at the same time. And because of this, they do not go to completion. I cannot say that all my N2 and all my hydrogen will react to give me ammonia only, full stop. Because when ammonia is formed, instantly the backward reaction begins. And ammonia begins to break down back into nitrogen and hydrogen. So this is forward, this is backwards. Once the forward begins, once there's product, the backwards begins. So as a result, the reaction does not go to completion. But there is this term here where we use called equilibrium. This part is not in the O level syllabus, but I'll just quickly cover this. So equilibrium is basically the basically the, the point in time, right, when the forward reaction is proceeding as fast as the backward reaction, such that whenever I form two ammonia, two ammonia breaks down back into the products. So there will come this moment in time when the both the forward and backward reactions proceed at the same at, at the same rate. So at this point in time, right, because I form as much product as my product breaks down back into my reactants. It means that overall there's no change. There's no change. Right? So one unique thing about a reversible reaction is that it can actually be affected by various conditions such as temperature, pressure, and catalyst. Later we'll touch more about this one. So now let's move on to the reaction which is used to make ammonia. Haber process. This was discovered by a guy called Haber Fritz very long ago, World War, I think it's World War One, where they used this to make ammonia to make bombs. Ah, it's actually a very simple reaction. N two H two together with high pressure, high temperature, and an iron catalyst, giving us ammonia. Okay, so where do we get the N two from? You would remember that actually air contains about seventy percent nitrogen. So it can easily obtain nitrogen from the fractional distillation of liquefied air. For hydrogen, hydrogen, this is actually obtained by steam reforming or the cracking of crude oil. 
Okay, so this is the reaction for steam reforming here. It's quite a straightforward reaction. Nothing in particular. You start with methane, with water, gives it steam, gives me carbon monoxide and hydrogen. High temperature, nickel catalyst. Straightforward. So to sum it all up, this is how you would write the chemical equation for the Haber process. Take note, reversible arrow. Please do not write a single direction arrow. Okay, so some of the points to take note for the Haber process. It's a reversible reaction. It's exothermic. It means that it releases heat. So if I write a delta H value, it would be negative or less than zero. If you recall, remember this means that the products are of a lower energy level than the reactants. Okay, that's why it is an exothermic reaction. High temperature, high pressure, but, 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 even though at high temperature, high pressure with a catalyst, only about 10 to 15% of the reactants is converted into ammonia. So this is actually not a, a very efficient reaction, but nonetheless, it is still the best reaction by which to make ammonia with. Some of the conditions for the Haber process can be affected, can, can, be, can, be, can be changed to, to affect the yield of the reaction. And you will recall that earlier when we wrote the equation, the conditions would be 250 ATM or atmospheres of pressure and 450 degrees Celsius. So why do we choose these two values, these two values of 250 and 450 degrees Celsius? Simply because if you realize this is actually a gas, this is a gas, and this is also a gas. So for gaseous reactants, for gaseous reactants, if I increase pressure, I will tend to increase the yield of the reaction. Right? It favors the forward reaction. Why? Imagine this. If I have this container here where I have my particles here, 1N2 and 3H2, if I were to increase the pressure, I actually bring them closer together. So it means that there's actually a higher tendency for them to react, right? Which means that if there's a higher tendency for them to react, it means that overall the forward reaction will be faster. So as a result, my U increases, okay? My U increases. But why do we not increase this to, let's say, 1,000 ATM? It's because to increase pressure, the, the container used to, to, to hold these gases must be very, very well made, very strong, thick walls. But you realize that as, as you make a container stronger and thicker, the cost also increases. So as a result, it comes to a compromise of 250 atmospheres of pressure. So why 450 degrees Celsius? is because the lower the temperature, the higher the U. If we check this graph out here, the lower the temperature as I go up, as my temperature decreases, the U actually increases. So if I fix 300 atmospheres pressure, as my temperature decreases, Theoretically, the U actually increases, right? But but you would realize that as 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 a chemical reaction, the lower the temperature, the slower it is because it cannot even start the reaction. Not enough energy is provided to overcome activation energy to begin the reaction. So if we use too low a temperature, the forward reaction actually reduces in speed. So as a result, as a result. The compromise is 450 degrees Celsius. So at this temperature, it is the best suited to produce the highest U of ammonia. And co coupled with the 250 atmospheres of pressure, these two conditions work together to allow for the highest possible economical U of ammonia from the Haber process. But at the same time, a catalyst is used as well. So if you recall, a catalyst is a substance which is used to speed up a chemical reaction. How? By providing an alternative pathway. It provides an alternative pathway of lower activation energy. So what does this, what does this mean? Lower activation energy. And remains unchanged at the end of the chemical reaction. So basically, imagine you are going through a mountain. You are going across a mountain. You either climb across a mountain or run through a tunnel. Eventually, you reach the same point, which is across the mountain, but you either go through a tunnel or climb over it. Of course, going through a tunnel is easier. So we imagine that the going through tunnel path is the alternative pathway of lower activation energy. So a catalyst, because it allows the reaction to progress via an alternative pathway of lower activation energy, it means that it speeds up the overall reaction. 
because if you need less energy, more particles, more particles in the reaction mixture would have enough energy to overcome activation energy, right? Okay, so this is an enrichment section. Take a quick look. If you would like to, you can pause the video here to look through the enrichment section. This is not in syllabus, it's just for your information only. Right, so let's do a quick summary. I need my N2 and I need my H2. My N2 comes from air. My H2 comes from steam reforming. Gives me my hydrogen, my nitrogen. These two gases come together at 250 ATM, 450 degrees Celsius, iron catalyst, and it gives me my ammonia. Okay, ammonia is condensed out at minus 34 degrees Celsius. The U, if you remember, is about 10 to 15%, which means that a large part of these two reactants is unused. So by condensing out the ammonia at minus 34 degrees Celsius, N2 and H2 actually remains as a gas. So this gas can be recycled back into the Haber process to produce more ammonia. Okay, so that was... The industry, the, the industrial way of producing ammonia. In the lab, if you were to like to produce some ammonia, there are some simple ways. You can react an ammonium compound with a hydroxide. You will have ammonia gas evolve. Ammonium compound with hydroxide, you will get ammonium, ammonia gas involved. And because these two reactions involve the production of water as well, the ammonia gas will be a bit wet. So how do you dry it? We dry it with calcium oxide. Why do we use calcium oxide? Because this is a base. Metal oxides are bases, so they are alkaline bases, which means that they will not react with the alkaline gas, right? So as you can see here, the calcium oxide will remove the water. Okay, we cannot use corn sulfuric acid because it will be an acid-base reaction, and I will it, basically I will have no ammonia left at the end of the day, right? Overall ionic equation, please take note. If you are unsure of how to write an ionic equation, please refer to the misconception videos of writing ionic equations. This is a very important equation to write. Ammonium plus hydroxide gives me ammonia and water. If state symbols are required, this will be AQ, this is AQ, this will be gas, and this will be liquid. Okay, please write them on the right side here of the ion. And ammonia having a lower density than air can be collected by upward delivery. We never collect ammonia through water. So we never do this. We never bubble it through water. Okay, we never do this method of collection because this will not happen. Why? Because ammonia is highly soluble in water. So if I, if I were to bubble this through water, I will not get any gas collected at all. So as earlier mentioned, Ammonia is largely used for the manufacture of fertilizers. Why? Because it provides the nitrogen component for the protein synthesis in plants. But other than nitrogen, of course, plants, re plants require other minerals. And we call this simply NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay, this sometimes appears in the MCQ, so please take note. And now we move on to the checkpoint. Simple reaction. H2N2 gives me ammonia, you will know, and there's iron wool here, basically serves as a catalyst. So what is the purpose of the iron wool? This is the catalyst. It's a catalyst to allow you to speed up the chemical reaction. It's a catalyst to speed up the chemical reaction. So in the industrial process, 15% of nitrogen and hydrogen reacts to produce ammonia. So if I were to assume that the same percentage conversion takes place in the lab, how much ammonia would it would be produced? So very simply, first of all, we must first write the chemical equation. Okay, so N2 plus H2 gives me NH3. And they are all gases. Let's balance the equation. So because they are all gases, we can simply compare the volumes of gases. Remember, under more concept, 
if it is a gas, we can compare by, by volume. So if I have 20 cmq of N2, I can say that it reacts with 30 cmq of H2 to give me 20 cmq of ammonia gas, which means that by molar equivalence, 2 moles of N2 is equivalent to 3 moles of H2, and this is equivalent to 2 moles of NH3. Okay? All right. Okay, so where was I? Ah, so let's continue with this part. 2 moles of N2 reacts with 3 moles of H2 to give me 2 moles of NH3. So if I were to do a simple volume comparison, I can say that at, at RTP conditions, 3 dm cube of H2 actually will react with, with 1 dm cube of with 1 dm cube of N2. Sorry, this is wrongly balanced. To give me 2 dm cubes of NH3, right? So if I were to translate this to the volume that was given in the question, I can say that 75 cm cube of H2 will actually react with 3 to 1 is, is division by 3, 25 cm cube of N2, and it will give me 25 and 2, 50 cm cube of ammonia. Alright? So this part is very straightforward. So if by right, this is 100% conversion. In reality, it's only 15%. So what is 15% of 50 cm cube? So the volume ammonia formed is actually 50 cm cube times 15%, 7.5 cm cube. Okay. If you are unclear about how these calculations are done, please refer to the more concept notes where this is explained in much more detail, much greater detail. Okay. So how would you expect the actual volume ammonia produced in the lab demo to compare with the actual calculated volume? Um, naturally, you expect it to be a bit less. It will be a bit less. All right? Why? Why is that so? Because if you were to recall the, mo the Haber process conditions, I have 250 atmospheres of pressure. I have 450 degrees Celsius. And I have iron catalyst. So if you were to assume that this two, that, that this is happening in the reaction vessel here, I can say that we have the heat, yes, we have the catalyst, yes, but there's something which is missing and that is the high pressure. So because there is no high pressure, this is absent. It means that the overall percentage conversion would actually be less than 15%. Right? Okay, so in an experiment, 40 cm cube ammonia gas was collected in a syringe. This syringe was joined to a second tube that was empty. The tube contains an iron catalyst was heated. Gas passed several times from syringe to syringe. So what happens? So imagine this. If you, if you read this question and you are stuck, what do you do? Very simple. Just draw a picture. So the first syringe contains 40 cm cube ammonia gas. You join it to another syringe, which is empty, nothing inside. The tube contains iron catalyst. So remember, the Haber process is a reversible reaction. So if my ammonia can be formed from N2 and H2, similarly, because the backward reaction can proceed, my ammonia can also break down into N2 and H2. All right? So what happens to the gas when it's passed across the catalyst? It decomposes to give N2 and H2. So write an equation to show this reaction. It's simply the reverse reaction. 2 ammonia gives me N2 plus H2. Three of this. Gas, gas, and gas. All right. When the apparatus was cooled to room temperature, some students thought that the total volume, volume of gas present would be 80 cm cube. So why did they think so? Why did they think that it would be 80 cm cube? So very simply, if this was 40 cm cube, okay, how many volumes of N2 would be, would be produced? 2 and 1. So 2 to become 1, I must divide by 2. I would produce 20 cm cube. And for this one, I would produce how many cm cube? 40 cm cube.
Okay, so 20 cm cube for this one. And 20, 40 divided by 2 times 3 is 60 cm cube. Sorry, not 40 cm cube. So if this is 40 cm cube, I will get 20 of this and 60 of this. So, so maybe the student assumed that this total 80 cm cube will be produced when all the ammonia is broken down into N2 and H2. Okay. But in reality, the actual volume was only 60 cm cube. Why is this so? This again goes back to the reversible reaction. So if, if my N, NH3 can break down into H2 and N2, I can also say that my N2 and H2 can react together to produce back my NH3. All right, so the reaction is reversible is reversible okay so sum of the n2 and h2 produced reacts to form back ammonia so as a result i do not get my full 80 cm cube some of it goes back forms ammonia so overall volume of gas is reduced all right, we have come to the end of the ammonia topic. As you can see, and as I promised, this is a short, sweet, and sharp topic. Largely involves the Haber process and the conditions of the reaction and some simple mole concept calculation. So, as, so to repeat again, if you are not very sure about how mole concept calculation is done, is done for gases, please refer back to the mole concept set of lecture series. Till the next lecture series, see you.